Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us today. All of those of you joining us online as well, welcome to the Avalon family. We're so glad that you're being a part of the service today. I've got a very important announcement that we're going to make at the very end of the service after the message today, so make sure you hang on for that. And uh, we'll have some important things that I think will be encouraging to you, we'll give you some information about what um, our future is going to be. It's going to affect you, it's going to affect your family, so we're very excited about these things as well. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about how to have a real faith, an authentic faith, something that is not fake, but it's real. Now, we all like authentic things, don't we? Uh, the fact is, nobody likes to be deceived. Nobody likes to find out that something that they were trusting in was not real. And so we all like something that is uh, real, that it's not fake. When I was a kid between ages 10 and 14, I went through this phase of collecting things. Now I began to collect a lot of things, and uh, some of these things were real. Some of them, I found out later, were not authentic. One of the first things I began to collect, and I don't know why I did this, but once again, ages 10 to 14, uh, 10 to 14 year old boy, how many have had kids that age? Raise your hand, okay? You know what I'm talking about. They're young skulls full of mush, right? They're not, uh, they're not absolutely all there yet. So I, I collected stuff. I, the first thing I collected was, and we'll see the picture up here, I collected rocks. There's some of the rocks. I collected arrowheads, which is a cool thing to collect. But I collected rocks. I actually bought these rocks at a, a place, a little store uh, in, a, in a place in North Carolina in the mountains. And don't ask me why. I don't know why I bought this stuff, but I thought that was the coolest thing in the world for just a little while. And then I went to another phase. It didn't take me long to get out of that phase. And I went to start collecting. We'll see the next picture. I started collecting stamps. Now, that's just a few of the stamps that I have. I've got thousands of them. I have no idea if any of them are worth anything or not. But for a long time, I collected stamps. I would order them, uh, sorry to say online, but they weren't online back in those days. Didn't have that back then. And, and I would uh, see stuff advertised, and I would buy these stamps, and I had a good time. And then, one day, I don't know if you were a big fan of comic books. I was as a kid, and I would read these comic books. And the back, back in those days, before the internet, before cell phones, Back in those days, in the back of a comic book, there would be these little advertisements for stuff that you could buy. Now, they were obviously aimed toward kids, uh, kids that didn't have any sense. Because I saw advertised in the back of one of those comic books that you could send in your money, and they would send you, are you ready, a gold nugget, a real gold nugget nugget that was mined in a mine in Alaska. Oh, I was intrigued. In fact, it didn't cost very much, and I thought to myself, these are suckers, all right? They are going, I'm going to send them just a few dollars. They're going to send me back a genuine, real gold nugget. I want you to see the picture of the gold nugget. I still have it. You can't even see it inside that little piece of plastic. It is the smallest thing. You have to have a microscope to see it. I was a little disappointed in that, to be honest with you. Of course, then I went on to the real thing that I collected. And this is actually something that I did collect, but some of it does have a little bit of value. I began to collect coins. And uh, the, here's some of the coins. There's an old, old $2 bill. Uh, there are uh, several little envelopes there. It's got old uh, paper money. There's actually Confederate uh, $20 bill there. There's some silver dollars. There's some silver quarters and pennies and dimes and nickels. And uh, I, I still have all of this. And I went through this phase where I was collecting all these coins. My grandpa on both sides had collected these coins. And I thought, man, this was the coolest thing in the world. And then one day, you're going to get the idea that I read comic books a lot because I did. All right. And one day I saw advertised once again in the back of the infamous comic book, I saw advertised real money. It was advertised as real money from the 1700s and the 1800s in the United States of America. And I thought I had hit the mother load. I thought as a young boy that 
I was going to be able to buy this stuff. It was going to be the most valuable thing in the world. Uh, you can see the front of this. Let's look at the next picture. Uh, these are actually some of the uh, notes that were from the 1700s and the 1800s. I was so happy. I sent my money in. Of course, back in those days, you actually mailed it in, and it took a few weeks, and you actually got it in the mail. It came in the mail one day, and this stuff, I was so happy. I was so intrigued. I had money that was authentic and real from the 1700s. I thought to myself, nobody else has this. This is awesome. And then imagine my disappointment when I saw the backs of these very same things. They are completely blank. And I sent my money in, my hard-earned money as a kid, uh, from the back of a comic book that it was advertised. Authentic, real money, but it was not. It was fake. It was not real. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I was very disappointed in that. But you know, when it comes to authentic Christianity, there are too many times that we too are deceived. We think something that is real, but we find out that it's not. We think we have something that is authentic, but when it comes to the storms, that we face in life, when it comes time for the real kind of faith that we need when the rubber hits the road, oftentimes we find out those that we love, those that we respect, those that we hold in esteem, sometimes we find out they don't have the real thing. We find out even in our own lives a lot of times that we don't have the real thing, that what we thought was real when it came down to the pressures of life, turns out that it was not so real. Turns out that it was not so authentic after all. And so today I want to talk to you about how that you and I can have a real faith. What does real faith look like? How do you get real faith? What do you base it on? How do you know that you can have something that will last through the storms of life? Well, oftentimes we think that the way we get a real faith is just simply by going to church. And i got to tell you, going to church is very important. You ought to go. We don't have church services just because we don't want you to come. But i got to be honest with you, every religion in the world has uh, something that you can attend. Just because you may go to church does not mean that you have authentic faith. In fact... There are many that we have observed in life. You probably know people like this. They go to church almost every week of their life. But when it comes down to it, you'd have to call them a hypocrite. Because they live one way at church on Sunday, and they live another way during the week. I've heard people say this all the time. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I work with this guy, and he goes to church, and he's a Christian. And if he's going to heaven... Well, I know I'm going to heaven, and their misunderstanding of the gospel, their misunderstanding of salvation is that they look at that person's works, and they say, well, that, what they have is not real. Maybe you think that moralism is what makes you a good Christian, that what, that's what makes you have an authentic faith, that if you'll just simply do something like keep the commandments, and we all know, and I've talked about this many times, you can't keep the commandments. In fact, when you begin to understand the sin behind each of these commandments, we all, everyone, without exception, have broken every single commandment. You say, well, I've never murdered anybody. Well, when you begin to understand what Jesus said in the New Testament, that even if you have hated someone, then you're guilty of murder. And the point there is simply this. The root cause of murder, the root sin, is hatred. And we've all hated someone before. And so every single one of us, when it comes down to it, we don't measure up. Moralism is not the answer. Turning over a leaf is not the answer. Jesus did not come to make you good. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't think you should be bad. I don't think you should intentionally break the commandments. Don't leave here and say, well, pastor said uh, the Ten Commandments are not important, so we can go steal something this afternoon. That's not what I'm saying. 
But I'm simply saying that if you think that moralism is the answer, you're not going to have what is real. If you think that the way that you get good faith is by being a good person, I've got bad news for you. The Bible says that God has this uh, beautiful standard. And if you're going to be right with God based on your goodness, the Bible says all of us, all of us without exception, we fall far, far short of God's standard. You see, here's the point. No matter how good you are, you fall short of the standard of perfection. You might be better than your neighbor. You might be better than your mother-in-law. You might be better than a person you work with at work. But listen, that doesn't matter. The comparison that you have against other people is not what is important. The fact is, you've got to compare your life to Jesus Christ. You've got to compare your life to the standard of God. And when you do that, how can, think about it. How can I stand before the God of the universe? How can I stand before the very personification of perfection, of all that is holy, of all that is good, of the divine standard? How can I stand before him and say, I'm good, I'm good? Oh, don't get me wrong. I realize that we can do good things. I realize that all of us are capable because we're made in the image of God. We're capable of doing good things. But listen, if the standard is perfection, just one sin, just one mistake causes us to fall short. And I've used this example before. It's like if you and I were to get in a jumping contest and we decided that the way to measure how far we could jump is that we went all the way out to Arizona to go to the Grand Canyon. Kim and I went to the Grand Canyon a few years ago and I thought I would, I, I've always had this thing about like trying to know a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff that I know is like useless facts. And I thought I was going to impress the, one of the uh, guys there that worked at the park and I was kind of like, you know, kind of proud of myself. I was like, uh, hey, I heard that uh, in parts of this canyon that it's like a mile across. And I smiled and kind of just stood back waiting for him to compliment my knowledge. And he looked at me like I was a total idiot. He said, no, no. He said, in some parts, it's 17 miles across. Well, what if you and I were to say, we're going to get in a jumping contest, and we're going to both try the hardest we can, and I was a gentleman, and I let you go first. And you backed up, and you ran as fast as you could, and you jumped, and you got 10 feet before you went down to the bottom of the canyon to your death. And me not being the sharpest tool in the shed, I backed up, so I was, you were already dead. I was going to prove you wrong, though, so I jumped back, and I took off, and I jumped further than you. In fact, I jumped 20 feet, which is pretty impressive, before I, too, fell to my death at the bottom of the canyon. The point is not that I could out-jump you. And the point is not that I could jump 20 feet if I could do that point is that we couldn't either one of us jump across the canyon and in the same way being moral is not what makes you have authentic faith Jesus did not come to make you good Jesus did not come to have you turn over a new leaf Jesus came to bring dead things to life he came to resurrect that which was dead. He came when the Bible says that we are dead in our sins, that Jesus came to make us alive. And it's not through our works. In fact, I'll tell you this, moralism is the enemy of the gospel. Oh, you may not think it is, but why is it that every religion in the world teaches moralism? Why is it that every religion in the world begins with the same premise, that if you'll work hard enough, if you'll be good enough, if you'll strive hard enough, if you'll reach high enough, maybe, just maybe, you might be good enough to go to heaven when you die or to please God, maybe. Every religion in the world starts that way. The difference between Christianity, we're talking real Christianity, true faith in Christ, and all the religions of the world is this. God doesn't ask you to reach to him. 
Because he knows you cannot reach high enough, no matter how hard you try. He does not ask you to reach to him, but rather he reaches down to you. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, that the second person of the Trinity that became human and was born, God who wore diapers as a little baby, God who had to learn to walk, the very one that created this universe had an earthly father that taught him how to hold a hammer. Can you imagine the indignity of that? Can you imagine how much Jesus had to suppress because he was God, but he became human, and he died on a cross for our sins? And my friend, that is the key to authentic faith. It's not going to church. It's not being moral. It's not even learning all kinds of traditions or rituals. Do you know that you can take all kinds of religious rituals and it doesn't make you any more Christian by going to church or doing rituals than if you were to go into your garage and think that you're a car. Just because you walk into a garage does not make you a car. And just because you go to church, just because you take communion, just because you get baptized, that does not make you right with God. That does not make you spiritually alive. That does not make you born again. But there is one thing. You want to have a faith that lasts? We're not talking about perfection. We all know that you can't be perfect. Not in this life. I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. I hate to admit this. But I probably most days of my life sin. I know that's probably not what you want to hear from your pastor, but it's the truth. I mean, the fact is, there are so many days that I struggle with things just like everybody else does. I struggle with temptation. I, I struggle sometimes with anger. I struggle with fear, just like you. And look, the fact of the matter is, that is not what makes us right with God. The fact is, it is the work of of Jesus Christ on the cross. And there is one thing that we're going to read about today. If you want a strong faith, if you want an authentic faith, if you want something that's real, if you want something that will last, well, the Apostle Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. That's what we're going to read today. Here's what he said. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you. That's the key. Which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved listen to what he said you received it you stand in it you want to have a real faith stand in it don't just receive it don't just be one of those that prays a prayer and says I'm a follower of Christ but you begin to stand in it you begin to practice it you begin to let God work through you be that person and you will be saved now notice what he said he said, by which you are being saved. Now, let me explain that to you. The moment you ask Christ, you are saved, immediate. But then he talks about you are being saved. What does that mean? Well, it simply means that you're in this process. You're in this process of growth. It doesn't mean that you work your way to salvation. It just simply means that you are being worked on, that God's not finished with you yet. And I like saying it this way. I may not be all that I should be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. I am being saved. In other words, it's a process. But then one day I will be saved. So I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. What does that mean? I receive Christ, God's working on me, and one day I'm going to be in the presence of God. And I won't have to worry about any of this anymore. So he says, if you hold fast to the word, I preach to you unless you believed in vain. And by the way, there are some that believe in vain. And what he means by that is that there are some people that they, they make a profession, but it's not authentic. They tend to think that they have faith, but it's not real. He said, and here's the key, for I delivered to you of first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. By the way, this is the gospel in a nutshell that he's giving us. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, uh, then to the twelve, talking about the twelve apostles. 
And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, they, they've passed away. They died. And then he appeared to James. That was the half-brother of Jesus who was a skeptic. In fact, he denied that Jesus was the Son of God. He denied that Jesus was the Messiah. He probably thought his half-brother was crazy. But after the resurrection, after the resurrection, he was converted. He appeared to James, uh, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul, this is Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let me read that, and I want you to think about that. I want you to let that sink in. I want you to meditate on that this week. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Do you know that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is exactly your sentiment as well? By the grace of God, I am what I am. I may not be all that I should be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be, and I'm not what I'm going to be one day. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believe. Well, let me give you the foundation of faith, the foundation of a real faith, the foundation of a faith that lasts, that gets you through the storm. And here it is. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the difference between Christianity and all of the religions of the world? Well, it's the resurrection. Muhammad, he's still in the grave. Confucius, he's still in the grave. You can think of any religious figure in the world. They are still in the grave. But the difference is between Christianity and all religions of the world is this one thing that Jesus died a real death. He died a death that we deserve to pay ourselves. And he was put in a real grave and he was really, truly dead. But after three days, he conquered death and got up out of that grave and he is alive today. That's the difference. That is the difference. And maybe you're a skeptic today, like James, the brother of Jesus was. Maybe you're like, well, you know, I don't know about all this Christianity. I don't know about this resurrection stuff. I mean, after all, that's a miracle. Well, do you really have a difficult time believing in miracles? Have you ever witnessed the birth of your child? A miracle. You ever look up into the stars at night and see the night sky that God made and then understand that not only are there billions of stars... But there are billions of galaxies that contain billions of stars. Well, it, friend, if you think that all happened by accident, I'm sorry, but there is just no evidence to support that at all. I realize some people that claim that God didn't create things, they say, well, I believe in science. Well, you know, science is really just looking for evidence, and my goodness, there is overwhelming evidence that there is a God. So... You know, if you have problems believing in miracles, just look up at the night sky. Just study human DNA, the most complex language in the universe. Do you think that just happened by accident? Do you think that the most incredible intelligence in the world could even come up with that? No, the fact is there had to be an intelligent being, a God that came up with that. I don't have any problem believing in miracles. You say, well, I don't know about this stuff about Jesus resurrecting from the grave. Here's what I know. There's so much evidence that supports it. And I don't start with questions like, why are there no dinosaurs today? Now, maybe you wonder that. And did God create dinosaurs? Yes, he did. Are dinosaurs around today? No, unless you count some people that are as old as dinosaurs, then no, there are no dinosaurs around today. You say, why did they go to extinct? I have no idea. Maybe they're stupid. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they were. 
kind of like a condor that keeps on eating plastic. And, and I realize people say, well, that's human's fault. No, if they wouldn't eat plastic, they wouldn't go extinct, okay? And I realize all the environmentalists are mad at me right now. But nevertheless, the point is, I don't have a problem believing in miracles. I don't have a problem believing that Jesus resurrected from the grave. And I don't start with the questions about how old is the earth. I don't know. And neither do you. I, I don't know how old it is. Here's what I do know. There was a man, and he said that he was the son of God. And he died a real death on a cross. And he was put in a real grave. And he got up out of that grave after three days. And all other questions aside, I'm going to throw my lot in with the man that got up out of the grave. That's who I'm going to throw my lot in with. And all these other questions, I, I don't know the answer to all of them. But I do know this that the resurrection is the one thing that gives me hope. And so if you want an authentic faith, real faith is rooted in the resurrection. Well, what does that mean? Well, the resurrection proves the deity of Christ. Listen to John chapter 20, verses uh, 28 and 29. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. He was one of the disciples. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He is the Son of God. He is deity. He is God in human form. The resurrection gives life-changing salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. You see, the resurrection is not just a little side note to Christianity. It is the whole ball game. Without it, we don't have salvation. The resurrection grants eternal life. I love what Jesus said. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You're going to die physically one day. But when you receive Christ, yet will you live. You'll have eternal life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Jesus is very clear that salvation comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's evidence for the resurrection. We just read some of it. Jesus appeared to over 500 people at once. He appeared to the apostles. He appeared to James. He appeared to Paul. There's so much overwhelming evidence. If this were in court, it would be a slam dunk case. He said, well, you know, that was just, you know, crowd hallucination. Never in history has there ever been a crowd hallucination of 500 people at one time about the same thing. And let me just tell you this. Um, if it were not true, all of those people that were claiming it was true would have been refuted by the people that knew it wasn't true, but they never were able to do that. Why? Because it's real. It's real. And Jesus promises us eternal life because of the resurrection. Uh, because of the resurrection of Jesus, there is the resurrection of believers. What will happen one day to your body is that even after you die, and by the way, don't worry about, you know, well, what if I was cremated or what if, uh, you know, what if I was never buried and my body decayed and just went back to dust? Well, guess what? Everybody's body goes back to dust. And if you think Jesus has any problem resurrecting your body, think about how difficult it was to create you in the first place. If he can create the eyeball, the ear, if he can create DNA, he doesn't have any problem raising you back to life. Not one bit whatsoever. Well, the second thought is this. Real faith is built on grace. On grace. You see, it's not your works. It's not what you do. Real faith doesn't depend on good works. It depends on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Real faith rests in Christ's finished work. Not on how hard you work, not on how good you are, not, not on how much you accomplish. Look, after you become a follower of Christ, your life should change. If there's no change in your life, maybe you want to check whether your faith is real. But this is all I've got to tell you, that it's not dependent on how good you are. Because I don't care how good you are, you're going to fail, and you're going to sin, and you're going to disappoint yourself, 
And you're probably going to disappoint other people too. And it doesn't rest on your work. It rests on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for that? Man, I'm so thankful that it doesn't depend on me. Because if it depended on me, I would go to hell. You say, well, don't you do pretty good stuff? I try. I really do. And as a pastor, I, I do a lot of good things. But the truth is, I would never be good enough. No matter how hard I tried. And neither would you. And, and thankfully, right believing leads to right living. When you begin to believe in the work of Jesus, and you begin to give your life to him, and you begin to trust him, you know what happens? Then you notice after a while that you're not constantly thinking about it. You're not constantly trying so hard with all your effort, but suddenly from within, God begins to change you. Why? Right believing leads to right, leads to right living. Once again, it is the grace of God, and we believe in the grace of God here at this church. But if you think that God's grace just simply is an open invitation to sin and live like hell, well, you don't understand grace. Because the more you begin to understand the grace of God, the more you want the work of God in you. And he begins to change you and bless you. Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. That is the key. God's grace. You must be built, you're building your life on the gospel. Then there's the final thought. Real faith. Trust God. You want a real authentic faith, it's not about doing good works, it's not about turning over a good leaf, a new leaf, it's not about your effort, it's not about your reaching to God, it is about God reaching down to you. Thank God for that. It's not your works. It's not your works. Once again, should you do good works? Yes. Should you try harder? Yes. God's grace is not against effort. God's grace is not against discipline, but if you're depending on your discipline to be made right with God or to make God love you, then you're going to be sorely disappointed because I don't care how disciplined you are. This week, we had uh, the Olympics start in Japan, the Summer Olympics. There are some of the most disciplined people on the planet that are competing in those games. Discipline. You're talking about discipline. But you know what? No matter how disciplined you may be in some area of your life, when it comes to spirituality and being right with God, you will never be disciplined enough. Can't do it. It's not your works. Real faith asks God. You know what the key is? It's asking God to help you. It's admitting to God that you can't do it by yourself. Uh, real faith survives the storm. The Bible says in Hebrews that he is the anchor for our soul. I get emotional when I think about that. You know why? Because the anchor does its best work in the storm. And there will be a storm in your life. I guarantee you, if you haven't been through a storm, you're getting ready to go through one. If you're coming out of a storm, hold on, there will be another one shortly. This is what this life is. It's a series of storms. There are a series of good things and a series of bad things that happen to us. But listen to me. The anchor is designed for the storm. In, in the still waters, you don't need an anchor. But when the storm rages, when the winds blow, when the waves crash against your ship, the anchor is what will hold you. The anchor is what holds me. It's not my goodness. It's not my effort. It's not my job to hold on to the anchor. It's the anchor's job to hold on to me. It'll survive the storm and it'll bring change. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. I love how this reads. It says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new crea uh, creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual, spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. Brings a new life.
You know another thing that real faith does? It stays calm. That just speaks of faith. Life throws you a curveball. You don't back up, throw your bat down, storm out of the stadium. You know what you do? You stay calm. There's another pitch coming. And and that's the beauty of the Christian life. You're not going to strike out unless you walk out. And if you just stay calm, God promises to be with you and to help you through the storm. I I love this from the message paraphrase, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Well, if we just do that, wouldn't it change some things in our life? Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness. Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. What's at the center of your life? Is it worry? Are are you so worried about political climates and all the stuff that we see in the media and all the stuff that we see on social media? Are you so worried that all you do is wring your hands and worry every day? Well, you can do that. Or you can let your petitions and praises be formed into prayers and God will come soon and will settle you down. You will discover that it's wonderful when you let God displace worry in your life with faith. It'll happen. It helps me to love others. Galatians 2, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit uh, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. In other words, he's saying it's not based on the law or my keeping of the law. Now, when you understand that, you know what you have to come to the conclusion of when you read that verse? That God declares it to be true in your life that the Holy Spirit has already produced love joy patience and well you know what I don't have any patience not according to scripture now you may not live like it you may not claim it but God says the Holy Spirit has already produced in your life love you got all the love you'll ever need you got all the loving actions in you that you ever need if you'll trust God you got all the joy that you're going to ever need in spite of any of your circumstances if you'll trust God. He's already put it in you. You just got to let him grow the fruit. And then finally, this kind of faith brings security. 1 John 5:13 it says, "I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life." Let me ask you a question. Have you ever doubted your faith? Oh, it's normal. We all have. If you're honest, we've all doubted it from time to time. I've shared with you in my past, there was a season in my life that I really doubted my salvation to the point that I kind of prayed that salvation prayer every night before I went to bed. Well, God, just in case, I'm asking you to save me. And I was young in my faith, and I didn't understand fully what it meant that you could be secure, that you could know that you have eternal life. But I want you to understand this. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you ask him, you say, well, how do I know if I have the faith? It doesn't depend on your ability to have the faith. It depends on God's ability to give you the faith. That's what we don't understand. When I ask, that's why he says, if anyone will ask, you'll be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why? Because when I ask God with an authentic heart, you know what happens? He is the one that gives me the faith to trust Him anyway. And you can know. And there are some of you today that you struggle with with your security and your faith. And because maybe you did something wrong this week, and the devil gets on your shoulder and he whispers into your ear, Well, if you were a real Christian, you wouldn't have done that. If you were really saved, how could you think that thought? 
If you're really saved, how could you look at that? No, but you think nobody knows, but God saw you look at that this week. If you were really a Christian, you might as well quit. No. Once again, if it's based on my works, then I'm screwed. But if it's based on him, I have glorious security in Jesus Christ. It's because of him, not me. Because of him, not my goodness. Because of him that I can say, I know that I know that I know that I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's not based on my works. It's not based on how good I am. It's not based on how faithful I am. It's based on the anchor for my soul. It's based on how faithful he is. It's based on how good he is. It's based on how much he did. And because of that, I can trust him. I can trust him. And when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I don't have to wonder if God is angry with me. You know what God did? He poured out all of his wrath on Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus, in my place, absorbed the wrath of God. Oh, make no mistake, God hates sin. God has wrath towards sin. But when you come into a relationship with him, when you trust him with authentic faith, guess what? He is no longer angry at you. He could not be, and you still be saved. You know why? Because he says that he cannot abide sin. He cannot abide the presence of sin uh, in his presence. There will be no sin when we stand before him. You know why? Because Jesus Christ has already paid for the sin and taken it off my ledger. And when I stand before God, he looks at me, and he doesn't see my sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And thank God for that. I can know that I know. Maybe today online, you need to know. And you can. Maybe in the room today, you need to know. I've got good news. You can. All you gotta do is trust him. I've explained the gospel to you. I've explained how it works. You know what it's up to you now? It's up to you to ask. The Bible, very clear, a verse I've already quoted, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not because you're good, not because you prayed a magical prayer, but because God loves you. And he loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die in your place. And so online, if you want to receive Christ, just ask. And on that button at the bottom of the page, you can click that you prayed to receive Christ. If today in the room you'd say, I want to receive Jesus today, I want to know today, all you got to do is ask. And I hope that when you ask, you'll take the next step card and put your name on it and check that you prayed to receive Christ today. Something like this, dear God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins. And I ask you to come into my life and change me and save me. Forgive me for my sins. I'm trusting you as my Savior. If you'll pray that prayer online, you receive Christ today. If you prayed that prayer today, you receive Christ today. Uh, Without even bowing our head, I wonder if there's anybody in the room today that said, Pastor, I prayed that prayer in my heart along with you today. I asked today for God to let me be saved. Let me be born again. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that? You prayed this prayer today in the room. Thank you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. God, you can clap. We rejoice at people following Christ here at this place. And then this is the last question. Are you living out an authentic faith? Once again, we're not talking about works-based. We're talking about Jesus-based. We're talking about resurrection-based. But you know, I know a lot of people that go to church, and they have no relationship with God. They have no authentic faith. Why? Because they've never trusted Him. They trust the fact of who they know or how good they are, and you just simply can't trust that. But you can trust Him today. Heavenly Father, above all else, help us to have an authentic faith, not because of us, but because of you. And above all else, help us to trust Jesus today. 
for it's in your name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Are you glad you came to church today? Amen. God's good. Uh, next steps. We've already talked about a couple of those things. You want to receive Christ today. If you'd like to be baptized, listen closely. Next Sunday, we're going to have baptism. Next Sunday. You don't need to miss it. Uh, if you need to be baptized, do it, to, uh, do it next week. And so uh, fill out the next step card. You already saw that. Drop it in the drop box on the way out today. And uh, we'll help you take your next step, no matter what that next step is. And so uh, I told you I was going to uh, give you one announcement uh, that's very important that we need to know. Um, you know that we are under contract to purchase land and a building uh, in Locust Grove. And uh, we had told you originally that we thought it, we would probably close somewhere around the end of August, maybe a month or so later. Well, we ended up finding out we hired an attorney uh, to help us. Very good, very respected attorney around here. And um, uh, he was very helpful. But there were some uh, things that are in the, uh, in the former owner's uh, I'm not even really sure what all you call it, but there were uh, some amendments that said things like, we didn't know this when we went under contract, but you can't change the outside of the building. You can't add on the building. You can't put another building on the property. Well, that obviously won't work for us. And so we hired an attorney and he said, there's no problem. These amendments get changed all the time. He says, so there's no problem with that. However, and we found this out, no matter whether we had any amendments that needed to be changed or not, any church that goes in to purchase any property has to get what is called a special use permit or conditional use permit or some terminology like that. And here's the problem. Because of COVID-19, Henry County commissioners are over six months behind. And so if there were no changes that need to be made in the amendments, it'd still be six months before we could even get before them for them to approve it, okay? Now, the good news is the owner understands that. He's working with us. We're still under contract. They're still saying they're going to sell us the property for the same amount. It's still all good. It's just going to take a little while longer. Now, this is something that we know that things like this don't move as quickly as we would like. Kim and I recently sold our house and we bought another house. We had five contracts that we had put on houses fall through not because we didn't qualify just because of this market and finally thank God one that had already fallen through before uh, they came back and said hey would you like to buy this house we're like yes yes somewhere that we could live yes please we're tired of living in a tent I'm kidding we didn't live in a tent anytime but the point is this a lot of these things just simply take more time than what we expect now, the good news is this. We have signed an extension on the lease here. Now, the reason for our leaving here is very obvious. The price has become uh, just kind of a, a weight around our neck. And uh, so we understand that. But the good news is that uh, we have signed a contract for an, a year extension. So bottom line is it's going to be at least a year before we can get to that place. All right. So in the meantime, listen closely. We're still moving forward. We're still trusting God. And listen, we are still planning to reach people here at this building. Let me say that again. We are still planning to reach people. We're meeting this week as a staff or next week uh, to talk about all the things that we're going to do to try to bring people in, try to see people safe. You know why? Because our mission is bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And just because we have a building or a different building or the same building makes no difference. We're still going to go forward. We're still trusting God. We're still pressing on. Amen? Amen. Well, the thing is, it just uh, makes the anticipation a little bit better. Now, here's the good news about that. I want to show you uh, just an update on our Doing Our Part campaign. Uh, we have uh, total commitments over $600,000, okay, which is more than enough to get us in the building, start saving us money, start planning for our next step, which is to build a brand new auditorium there connected to that. Uh, but I want you to see, here's what's next. Uh, on that, let's go to the next slide there. Um, 
We've got $336,184.21 on hand as cash on hand available for closing as of today, as of actually this last week. Um, and what's left to have so that we can close, because we have to have $500,000 on hand to close, is $163,815.79. Now, the good news is this gives us a little more time to raise this money. And I want you to understand, we don't close if we don't raise this amount of cash on hand. All right? We don't close. Um, and so, but we know we're going to. And the fact is, if we continue to give at the rate we're giving, we're going to blow past this and it'll be wonderful. But just take it seriously. Pray about your commitment, being faithful to it, giving. For those of you that have not made a commitment yet or have not given yet toward that, and there are a lot of folks in our church, probably 40% of our, or 35% maybe, of our regular givers that have not made a commitment yet. I would challenge you to make a commitment and uh, begin to give toward this, and I believe God will bless it, okay? So that's the, that's the update. We're going to be here for at least another year. We're signing, we're signing the extension, uh, so we've got a place. We're not going to be kicked out, all right? Thank God. And by the way, can I say this? Don't get into the mindset, just because we're moving, don't get into the mindset where you're not thankful for what God has done in this place. And by this place, I'm talking about this building. You know that there have been well over 1,500 people saved in the services in this building. There have been well over 1,000 people baptized in those waters right over there. There have been countless numbers of people who have had their lives changed in this place. When I think about what God has done for us in this building, it makes me so grateful. Now, does that mean we want to continue to pay more than we should? No. But thank God for this building, this location. Would we like to get out of here where there's not trash in the parking lot? And even though we pay all of our cam fees, they don't mow the grass. If you notice that the grass is about knee high out there, that's not our fault. That's the people that we call landlords. All right. So, um, and uh, so we're going to ask them, please mow the grass. All right. Please mow the grass. Will we like not to have to worry about that? Yes. But thank God for this location. Thank God for what he's done in this place. Thank God for all the lives that have been changed. The thousands of messages that have been preached in this place. Because God has been good to us. Amen. God has been good to us. And I rejoice over that. God bless you. Let's stand together. I love you. Thank you for being here with us today. Have a great week, and we'll see you this next week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.